conscious of the time that I uh, will have eaten into it. So, so this, this paper, is, um, it's been work that's been going on for quite some time. I have to admit, it's like been now seven, eight years uh, uh, that we've been working on this. Um, because it involves, in the end, um, a randomized controlled trial that we wanted to do in Ethiopia uh, around, you know, is, is there something we can do regarding um, people's aspirations and their uh, sense of trying to achieve more? And is that actually an aspect of something where we can via an intervention study whether that's really a constraint on on people's outcomes and so it, what we are presenting here with um, is, is, is a paper that looks at the longer term outcomes of something we did essentially in 2011 and, and 2012 uh, in some really poor settings in rural Ethiopia. Um, I will tell a little bit more about Ethiopia in a moment but the thing that um, you know, you can well imagine that these kind of issues may well play a role even in rural Indian settings and in other contexts. Um, and the question we want to ask is the fact that people may have low aspirations in their lives, call it a bit like maybe having given up and not aiming high anymore, limit what actually people end up doing in their behavior and the choices they make. And the possible we want to deal with is that, you know, there's, there's many reasons, of course, why um, very poor people may not be investing in profitable opportunities. And, you know, I'm definitely one of these economists that want, would want to, in general, focus on, you know, the constraints that people are facing in markets, in just their asset holdings in, um, you know, all kinds of policies. But we cannot dismiss the fact that actually, you know, there may well be forces at play that stop people aiming higher, for example, because life has been hard and they've kind of given up a little bit. So the question we want to ask is, is it maybe possible that people don't invest because they actually have low aspirations, you know? beliefs about what is possible for themselves in their future, the kind of things they can aim for. Uh, um, and, and if these things are low, what they aim for is low, it may well cause them to limit effort or investment. And of course, there's some uh, well-known papers that theoretically have, have explored this. Dalton and co-authors in the Economic Journal, Jenny Corin Ray uh, in Econometrica, that actually talk about like models, in fact, equilibrium models where people may end up being trapped in low outcomes, partly to do with uh, the fact that they, their, uh, their aspirations are not set very high. Um, so what we do in the paper is something that um, we wanted to be <laughs> very careful with, you know, trying to alter maybe people's aspirations in the field and very cautiously we only try to do it a little bit uh, but what we want to do is to expose them to quite successful people within their own context so exposure to role models and we invited people in our study to watch documentaries about some uh, people that from very similar background than themselves they have been actually quite quite successful um, that's all the papers, of course, who've done that, including in India. I've talked about not necessarily doing this experimentally, but actually argued that exposure to uh, role models, think of the Beeman and others paper on West Bengal, that actually may well affect, uh, in their case, investment uh, in girls and, and the ambitions that they may have uh, in, in, uh, for, for office um, in, in their study. Um, and we wanted to actually see whether the study, the, the impacts we observe, whether the impacts we observe are actually coming from um, the fact that they are um, just exposed to some kind of media, some things they watch and see, whether it's the media itself or whether it's actually 
the content. So we want to make a distinction with that. And so what we do is we have a placebo. We actually also show uh, people videos of, and I'll explain a little bit more, that can be seen as a placebo relative to the exposure to role models. Um, and also we can in our study uh, test for whether this is really um, you know, the, the fact that outsiders came into the village to start with, uh, or other forms of uh, other um, ways that this plays a role, including spillovers, by actually having villages that we use as a pure control where uh, none of these things are actually happening. Uh, so, in fact, what we'll, we'll, we'll show later on is that our intervention is within village uh, uh, intervention, but we also have pure control villages that allow us to, to look at spillovers and so on. Anyway, we look at a range of psychological mechanisms. And, um, and so in the end, the question is, do changes in aspirations have actually persistent effects, not just after uh, less than a year when we first went back to them, after about six months or eight months uh, in some cases, uh, we actually went back five years later to see, you look, this exposure to these role models, does it make any difference? And of course, there's more and more studies that look at longer term impacts. And so that's um, what we uh, uh, then actually can talk to the literature. So let me first spend a little bit of time um, talking about a bit of the conceptual framework then give you a bit of a flavor where we're working, then actually the intervention, and then actually largely focus on the results. So in fact, in time, I'll focus a bit on the conceptual framework, see whether you can buy, buy it. Um, I don't mind if anyone wants to inter, in, um, uh, interrupt me um, in this, uh, in, 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 when I talk about these things, um, and, but the chair can, of course, alert me, me to that. I don't mind at all. But so let, let's briefly look at the conceptual framework. Okay, so ultimately it's quite simple. I'm not going to show you the whole model. Uh, we're still fine-tuning the paper at the moment um, where we've written out the model, but I, I, I hope I can take you along with a bit of the intuition of how uh, the optimization model actually looks like. Yeah, so starting point is really an intertemporal consumption and asset allocation model. People have some resources to start with, um, and then in each period they need to decide whether they are going to um, consume or indeed invest, uh, the, invest uh, in, in productive activities that then give you a return in the future. Similarly, they could consume the leisure now, or they could expend the effort that then, you know, by the time of the harvest or something comes in, um, they actually get a, get a return from it. So you have a time endowment and you can choose some leisure or you put some effort in it, or you can actually save and invest for the future, or, or you can consume uh, your resources. The way we set it up in a very simple way, there's just two activities. In each period of time, uh, the resources we have minus what we consume it, we can put in, um, in, in, in investing and W is the share of the investment of uh, one particular type. In fact, we'll consider one kind of an activity that is where we need to use efforts to get a return from, potentially risky, you know, what we have in mind in the end is agriculture where you know the 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 the, the asset or you know, the capital that we invest is a fraction of of these resources they also need some effort at point t and then we have a return that's governed by uh, essentially a revenue function um linked to the effort and the capital we put into it you know we have in, the, in a way in mind production function that behaves as we typically would do say in agricultural set, uh, settings to dream Um, God. boosting aspiration so much that it actually harms them. You know, we make them 
uh, thinking that they can achieve a lot, but actually we make them actually frustrated. So maybe that level of aspiration that this community had, maybe that was just rational. You know, those of you who know a bit of, say, sociological literature, it may well be like, a Dur like Durkheim, the, 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 the sociologist in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, would, would say, well, we can explain these informal behaviors a lot to do with, well, there's good reason why they, they do it. There's a functional reason why they do this. So we want to be careful because we may suddenly make them all think they can get really well off and doing all kinds of things. And as a result, after five years, we make them more miserable and actually life is worse. And in fact, a lot of people when we initially did a study uh, raised this as an objection saying, are you sure you're going to manipulate their aspirations and their hopes and so on? And, and we've always taken it very consciously and I'll explain a little bit how, how, how we did this. But it becomes then an interesting question after five years. We may have boosted the aspirations. We may see a whole kind of set of behaviors and actions that people take, but maybe we've made them very unhappy afterwards as well um, and frustrated that, um, that, that actually they, they did this. Or alternatively, if it is the case what our hypothesis was, somehow or another these aspirations have been pushed so low that actually it is in a way potentially harming them by nudging these aspirations up a little bit, moving them a little bit up, we may actually help them to getting a better outcome and, 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 and outcomes that actually are, are positive. So it's a tricky study in that sense. And um, I'll take you then now Officer? along to... So, go, yeah. Yeah, can I ask? Uh, so I thought that uh, somehow you will link the aspirational level to the to their investment decision and their effort level, and that's where the story comes. That if you have a higher aspirational level, then you put more effort, or you are like likely to take yeah. more risky decisions. So where that connection will come from? It will come now because actually if we now write this out as a model, we have a concave mm -hmm. utility function and we have these constraints. And I will talk you through, actually it's the next slide, I want to talk to you through, and in fact, you know, it, we, we definitely can, uh, and can share in due course the, the first order conditions and so on. We'll actually get that because think of it, you know, if we say there is a real cost from uh, not getting your, not reaching your aspirations, then mm -hmm. people will try to actually make sure they adjust their behavior. And, and so if, if there wasn't this Z thing, we get a, a, a standard portfolio choice model and we're getting certain first order conditions, expected we're going to have um, you know, a portfolio choice first order condition, relative risky versus safe activities. We're going to have an intertemporal first order condition, consumption to do relative to tomorrow. Nothing different from the you know, standard Deaton model and, and many more models. Now, by having this term in it, people, since there is a loss from not getting to your aspired level, um, you will try to make sure that if I now boost my aspirations for the future, I'm going to actually boost, I'm going to tell you, actually, you could achieve more in your life and this is the kind of things you, go, you should, should aim for. I'm actually going to say, well, I better make sure that in the future I'm going to get them. I'm going to, okay. And I'm actually going to need to adjust my behavior today so I have a better chance that in the future my gap between my actual outcome and my aspired level is actually not going to become bigger, but in fact smaller. So I'm actually, by putting it up, I'm actually mm -hmm. going to follow in my behavior. So what we literally get, the intervention, we push up the aspirations for the future. I actually said, wow, now I have to be very careful because my current behavior would have, had, would have been predicated on, on a kind of a set of aspiration levels of today and, and every period in the future. Now these levels in the future have go up. I must make sure these gaps are not too big. I'm actually needing to move resources to the future. I need to make sure that I get, have a better chance of getting them. I need to make sure that I don't take too much leisure today, but actually invest now a bit more for the future because I need to adjust that. 
Similarly, I must make sure I, 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 put, I, I save a bit more and I put it in the way, the best way that I can achieve uh, the, the outcomes in the future. So the model will then predict if I can boost uh, higher, if I can boost aspirations for the future, I will shift away from current consumption to actually having more assets for tomorrow. I will shift also some leisure towards the, uh, the activities that require more effort to raise future consumption. So what we definitely predict is that if we artificially, as we do here, boost their aspiration, we will think they're going to move towards more assets uh, for, for the future. Now, the interesting thing is, and that's where it alludes to with this sense of frustration and have we overplayed it, the welfare effects after five years will tell us whether we push them too far, whether we've pushed them to move far more resources, to invest far more, more in the, towards the future than actually for, for outcomes today and in each period in time, that we've made them too future oriented, so to speak, or alternatively, whether they actually started with low aspirations and moving them forward, we actually got them to in fact, uh, to, a, to, a higher, um, to, to a higher level of welfare also in the, in the future. So we'll use that more to actually test, mm, should we have really done what we did? But the prediction definitely from the model is that indeed, as, as you were suggesting, we, we are pushing um, both effort and resources to the future once we start pushing our aspirations for the future. Okay, uh, so that's, uh, Stephen, yeah, please. I, I, I have a, uh, a point here, like, so your assumption of exogenous benchmark is not a forced one, uh, at least uh, in a macro setup under competitive equilibrium, you typically assume that you do not have any control over the, the benchmark, right? So it's a like pretty standard assumption in a competitive framework, right? That, that's actually interesting. Uh, because you typically assume that, well, you do not have any control over the average or whatever your benchmark is because your decision is not going to affect the benchmark. So it's a pretty good, like, nice assumption. That is what okay, I good. think. From, from I, the I, I thank you for that. I, I thank you for that. That it's, uh, so that, that it's, that, that oh. it's, uh, that, yeah, go, please. Yeah, and the second one is I have a question here when you are saying like welfare effect after five years. So are you maximizing a, a, a long-term uh, uh, lifetime utility or just a, a period-wise utility? No, so we, we do, uh, you know, the, the I, and as you see, so the, the well, I'm trying to get my slides uh, just to go back. You know, we, we we're actually going to do an additive intertemporal utility function that we're maximizing. So we're not doing period by period. It's definitely not a myopic model. We, we are forward looking model, uh, maximize effective utility. We've written it as, a, as an infinite uh, horizon model. Um, there's some bits there, but um, you know, we, we, we can, uh, yeah. So, so, so we are maximizing temporary utility, but it's, it's somehow to say is that, um, that especially at the level of the subjective well-being is probably where we're getting at. So you know, when we say in the long-term welfare effects, you know, if we really push them too far, you know, and, and, and those of you who know a little bit of some of these papers that inspired uh, Deborah Trey and uh, Garan Chenico to write it, which was uh, a bad writer, um, an anthropologist, sociologist writing about Bombay, where he's saying, look, the problem is if you get these aspirations pushed too high, you're actually getting really this frustration reflecting themselves, really suboptimal behavior. You know, if you want everybody to be Sachin Tendulkar or, or a Bollywood star, then, then actually they're going to be frustrated and actually in the end, it, they're going to become more miserable. And so, so there's a bit of that saying, you know, after five years, if we push them too hard, we would have expected that um, subjective well-being at least would start saying, you know, what are we now doing? And relative to our control groups, we may have started to see maybe some, some negative uh, effects as well. And I can definitely tell you some interesting results e e emerge uh, afterwards. If that's an answer, that's... Thank you, thank so I saw you. it more as a kind of an empirical thing. I can see somehow, at least in the data, what, uh, what, what, what is going on there. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. good. Let me tell you a little bit about Ethiopia. You know, you know that 
I mean, for the purpose of the paper, there's not a huge amount to know. You, you, you could imagine to be in a very remote, the, the villages we have is, is, is like being in a, in a remote setting in, 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 in bits, of, bits of India, in, 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 in tribal areas or, or something. You know, we are dealing with, you know, you see the map of Ethiopia there, you know, the Red Sea is there on top. There's a little green dot that you may just about seen there is where we are. So we are kind of in the outskirts. Uh, this is actually the border with Somalia already. Um, uh, sorry, they're very close to the border with Djibouti, I should have uh, said. We're getting there closer. But actually, more importantly, if you look at the topography, um, we literally are we, we talk, talking about something called an escarpment. So suddenly there, the mount the um, mountain um, front goes down there's a ravine essentially of maybe more than you know uh, two thousand meters down where basically you have a, a depression of the land but it also kind of means you know you're the outskirts of how you can be connected with uh, with the rest of the world uh, i'm just going to switch my phone off for a moment uh, yes um, and um, I'm having one of these days, but anyway, so so we, we we see there, and it's basically we're in a remote setting where a lot of stuff is 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 going on, um, and uh, um, but it's well the where 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 the where it's very hard to um, to actually trade with the rest of the world and and, and so on. So I'll, I'll show you a bit more of the village. So. Um, it's, this is a rural isolated uh, setting. It's a very poor district. They're all um, subsistence farmers. And it's really one of the very, very poor parts of Ethiopia, okay? People are largely subsistence farmers. They do sorghum, maize, these are typical crops. You know, people are typically their own holders of land. Um, many people hire a bit of labor in during the harvest. But actually, that hired labor is a bit like uh, the, the worst forms of casual wage labor in rural India. That's really not, you know, this is not wage labor that gets you very far. It's actually what the poorest people do because they may not have enough land and then work on it. So lots of people don't even, uh, even though there's been big land reforms for a long time, they, they, um, uh, they rent in a little bit of land because they, they, they may be able to do a bit more. Probably more strikingly here is that um, even though Ethiopia, because of the nature of the soil conditions and so on, and there's a long established use typically of fertilizer for the kind of agriculture they do, um, relatively speaking, this is, this is a, low, a, a low spread of, of, of modern agricultural techniques um, in, uh, relative to Ethiopia. Many people also keep some livestock as a as a way of um, storing their wealth and then producing milk and other products. For, uh, but uh, even though there's lots of livestock disease, they don't really can't they can't really afford much uh, livestock input. And actually, the spread of modern technology we would consider for Ethiopian settings very limited, despite the fact that they, that in the 74 villages we were studying, there were actually 10. Uh, crop and livestock extension facilities nearby. So it's actually, you know, it's quite a spread there of, of kind of interventions to do this, and uh, it's not quite there. So for standards of Ethiopia, probably for global standards, this is a, pretty, this is a really, really poor village. Um, they mainly do agriculture. The bottom end has a bit of some data there, but probably the first column helps you a bit. A few people do the wage labor. Virtually everybody does crop agriculture. Off-farm activities are still, relatively speaking, quite rare. Many people have little bits of livestock. Um, it's not necessarily cattle, but it's often just goats and sheep to supplement their income. Um, the exposure is really limited. Their, their, their position on, on the map is, um, is, is really very striking. So this is, these are people that don't get exposed to that much, okay? 60% um, had only seen TV once in the last year, 12% uh, had ever traveled outside the district, not much migration. Um, in terms of school participation, 55% of the 6 to 20 years of voltage school, that's for Ethiopia, not too bad, but again, more on the lower end. Probably most strikingly, these are areas where sociologists have studied in the past 
And these are the kind of things that, um, that you hear from them. People uh, describe their lot a bit like, we are a people waiting to die while seated. You know, there's probably nothing more sad to, to, to hear in, in these kind of qualitative studies. Uh, it's alive with no thought uh, for tomorrow. We have neither a dream nor imagination. And that's the kind of thing. And that's actually, it is, that was what inspired us, this kind of repeated studies about rural Ethiopia that you can have in, in, in very poor settings across the world, where people say the kind of, There's nothing there, you can at least benchmark whether any of the changes we see in the village um, is, has anything to do with, with spillover. So that's allowing for, I'm not going to say that much about it. Let me simply say is that all our results are, are robust to, this, to the, this, uh, the possibility of spillovers. If there's anything, there were some spillovers in the village in a positive sense. So probably our results that I will show you are possibly an underestimate of the of the actual results and i'll leave it at that and leave it for questions later so it's quite a complicated design so we have 74 villages of 5200 people we have this pure control 10 of them 64 actual villages we then have you know groups in each village that were selected in the treatment in placebo in the control and then we also had in the pure control villages some households we started in 2010 uh, with the baseline, the videos came then uh, in, in later in 2010, the exposure. We did a uh, midline uh, study about six months or a bit longer in a few places in 2010. And then in 15 and 16, we did the end line and, you know, and, it's, and um, Ethiopia went on to all series of, of uh, upheaval. So we couldn't quite finish with our local team some of the things on the data. So that's why we're still in 2020 trying to to finish this whole thing. Okay, let me rush in the interest of time to actually go to quickly say something on the videos and show you something on the results. So the idea was they tell, these people tell their stories. And so you can see here, you know, this, for example, someone's life here. And, and the idea was a bit of a vicarious experience as they call it in psychology, you know, somehow to, to make them, yeah. Someone wants to come in? Oh. Okay, uh, I'll continue. Um, so, you know, they, 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 the fellow villagers had to, uh, so, so they, they, these people were telling their story, what had happened. And so, and this was a, a, a particular person who has totally, deep, was so poor to start with that as the subtitle, if you can just about see it on the screen, their fellow villagers had to contribute a bit of money to help this couple to make a start. So they were really desperately poor to start with. But then this person, it was actually the woman, started building up all kinds of things. So she started doing some, some trading. She then actually bought a donkey to actually be able to trade more quantities to move between markets uh, and, and, and have uh, to carry the heavy loads. She then made enough money to set up a village shop, which is actually quite exceptional already for Ethiopia. And... Uh, and it's actually quite nice in the video. It's the husband telling the story, but it's all about the wife. And then he comes with this, the, the killer sentence that we didn't script for him. It's just uh, too beautiful to be true for us. Is that basically say, he literally said, you know, she's not only my wife, she's everything to me. And she's totally a role model for the people in the village uh, in it. And so, so it's, it's, um, and it's a really uplifting story if you have the time to go to the channel. They're, they're, they're quite quite remarkable of, of how they tell. So we had four of these similar ones. The idea was that we would, these were similar people, induced maybe a little bit of, oh, well, maybe we can do something here. Uh, this, is, this is a setting where we are showing these, these screens. So you see the picture there and, and have it. Let me quickly say how we do the evaluation then. Extremely standard. We have an outcome variable. A, uh, that that uh, set of outcome variables, and basically we look at 
um, a treatment effect, the effect of the video. Um, but the problem is that the treatment ourselves could be the fact that some outsiders come in the village, they are exposed to media and the video content itself. So it's like a bundle. That's why we have then the, plus, the placebo there as well. And then clearly delta minus rho, uh, so P is the placebo, uh, delta minus rho is and gives us a bit of, no, that's the pure effect of the content of the video because if all these placebo people also saw a video, also outsiders came into the village and so on. So we have a pub there, we do multiple um, corrections and so on. The tables are that I show you have a lot of these details in it. I, I think virtually for all the results, the, the multiple testing corrections um, make or still allow us to, to come to the same conclusion. So I won't say that much about it. The pure control uh, villages can come in as well. So we have at the five years, we managed to do it as well. Um, but basically, uh, I'm not going to say too much, but it's almost self-evident what it is. Let me quickly say what we test and I'll show you the results and then I'll finish. Um, so, you know, first hypothesis was, look, maybe exposure to these uh, role models will shift up their aspiration levels. They believe that they can achieve more, their, 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 their reference point, whatever you want to do it, we measure it through you know, direct question I'll show you in a moment on aspirations, also their own expectations for the future. They're also their own ability to control their future. We have a number of things that touch on, on these things. But the aspiration expectations are arguably the closest to what we could say the reference point. We look at labor supply, and human capital. We look at future oriented behavior uh, and so on. Um, so th the investments, and we try to check can you give also an idea? I mean, you gave us a nice context of where the, what are the kind of shocks that usually take place in these kind of villages? I mean, oh, okay, is it a very risky kind of, you know, drought kind of prone place or is it, I mean, you know, so the fact is that it's poor is quite obvious. So, you know, they have a very low endowment to begin yeah. with, but I'm wondering what the shock structure is, you know, is it a... Okay. Yeah. So, so look, this is, this is, this is a, um, this is range for agriculture. This is drought prone areas. In fact, from the crops they grow, maize is the highest return one, but actually needs quite good rains. That's why they also grow quite a lot of sorghum. The fact that they diversify their, their, uh, their activities by having livestock is just a pure sign is that they actually readily need to use these to smooth their consumption and sell their lambs and so on to earn some money. So this is a drought prone area. That's the bigger shock. In these kind of communities, Health services are very limited. So health, labor supply shocks and so on. So I'm not entirely sure where you want to go with that, but that's basically the context. So there's, they, 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 they usually want to be careful. In fact, another paper I've written on this context, not that different from here, um, is, um, yeah, the, from the context uh, the here is actually that a lot of the reason why they, are very much often not adopting new technologies may also have to do with that. But in, in a way, we wanted to test something slightly differently. It's not because they're so conservative and trying to play it safe that they're not going for higher return, higher offer activities, but actually it's maybe something else at play. So correct me. I saw the question coming up in text and I'll come to that. You know, can we distinguish the information content with the other things? And I'll come to that in a second. But Abirup, is that helpful? Yeah, I was actually more interested in the dynamics because in some sense you're going to look at what's going to happen to the long term kind of, you know, whether it's good or bad yeah, yeah. into the welfare. Okay. And I was just imagining okay, if good. these are places with shocks, whether they put people on different trajectories and whether yeah. people adjust in some way or the other. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Is that, but of course we are in a, we, uh, the advantage still to do it within village is that, that most of these shocks would be, I mean, it's an RCT, so there's three groups, a control group, a placebo, and a treatment group. You know, of course, the covariate shocks, they all experience together. So at least we should be able to pick up something, you know, suppose, uh, assuming that, that there's no reason why certain groups affected more by one set of the shocks than the other one. Uh, and of course, that's the randomization should take care of that. That's one thing. An interesting point that you make, and that's, that's that, that you're kind of correct about, is that maybe we've induced them to the, by the intervention to take them a bit more risk 
So it's possible that the welfare effects later on could be negative just because they were actually unlucky. We pushed them towards more uh, risk. And it's not because we were wrong to push them to risk, but maybe they were just a bit unlucky that a, that a couple of bad years right, right. hit them. And, but we, I can tell you in the end, we don't see that. Okay, so that was a worry for us. And in fact, we're doing a study in Kenya where we're much more worried about that it gets, because there were some really big shocks happening and um, that, that is affecting it. Okay, so thank you. So, so, so basically here with the hypothesis, uh, pushing the psychological, the, sorry, the aspirational, uh, aspiration related things. That's the first thing we think we may well be doing with intervention. We then make sure that we ask ourselves, are people going to invest more, uh, work more hard and maybe invest more in human capital, or are they going to more invest in physical things, in, in, in the high return activities, and so on. So these are the primary hypothesis. The next one is, we want to actually test the whole series of things. A correct criticism you could say, well, maybe you just have shifted try time preference. You know, and it's very hard actually to distinguish that. So what the route we take is to actually say, well, let's at least measure discount rates time preference and actually see whether anything to do with the intervention shifts that. Now, if we make them more future oriented, it could be because we changed their discount factors. Uh, similarly, we could have changed their risk aversion, maybe as some people had suggested. And then the other one is the information. You know, the video show us something and there's information content. So we will, and I'll tell you in a, a, a bit in a moment, actually, let me tell you now, what we did is we dissected the information carefully. What, did, what were the stories that people told them and what things came up that they did to get better off? And we actually tested whether the treatment by any chance uh, or by the intervention actually ended up doing more the things that they saw these people having done, or was it more to do with, which is our hypothesis, in general, they started thinking more about what they could do themselves. And in fact, we find in any case that we have no evidence that they do more the things that the people in the video said they were doing relative to the control and the placebo group. So suggesting that it actually does work for, through the psychological channel. I'll, I'll give you that in the interest of time. And then the final thing, go on, please. Uh, professor, I have, a, I have a question here. So here, uh, uh, aspiration has been modeled as a threshold value, right? So, but there is a psychological, as you have mentioned, there is a psychological channel as well. So uh, uh, the alternative way maybe is to model it uh, from a self, perceived self-efficacy point of view, yep. right? Um, so so uh, the, maybe they are, the, the poor people are very much overwhelmed by their own predicament and they're not investing for that, uh, for, uh, that, that um, phenomenon. Um, yeah. So what do you think about that? So, yeah, so, so, so in, a way, uh, in, in a way, I think you said two things here, which is, you know, it could be a self-efficacy channel, which is, I think, actually hard to distinguish from what we have. And in fact, we ended up trying to, we have measures directly of self-efficacy in our study and, and locus of control, being in control of your future. So we think it's, it's a bit hard to do it. The second part, though, you appear to suggest they don't really have time that much to invest in it, suggesting more some kind of bandwidth type of issues that, uh, that they may be facing. Um, and that they, you know, they, they're not quite, thinking about these things and uh, and so on uh, in that sense. I think if it was more a bandwidth thing, uh, then I would have thought that this information content would have been the one that I'm triggered. It's a bit like in the typical studies is that actually you made them actually think about, uh, think of the, the studies of uh, the seaweed, I think in Indonesia, um, that, that, um, um, that actually is a bit like by pointing something out, they start doing it here by, by showing something particular. So we don't think it's a simple bandwidth thing, uh, but the efficacy, the more broader thing is like, you know, do they, have they given up trying somehow? And, and, and we actually, in, 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 a, in an earlier draft, we actually had a model where, where we modeled it more as some kind of, uh, something in the kind of, in their production function almost that, somehow they can't get it together somehow they can't 
they can't quite have the beliefs that they can actually really get these inputs optimally allocated or something. Uh, you know, first order conditions, you get very similar type of things. So, so we're going there. I, I must say then, having read endlessly some of these self-efficacy psychological literature, since nobody's really clear what they really mean, I actually gave up a little bit uh, on, on that, that route. But the spirit is in any case there. But I found it harder to pin it down in that sense. Okay, so, uh, okay, I see a question about some measurement things. Let me quickly go that. And Abirup or someone else has to at some point tell me if I really run out of time because I, I, um, I, I don't want to keep you longer given that I made you wait earlier. Um, but, but briefly, and I think it touches on the, the psychological uh, issues there. So first of all, we, we, what, one thing we did innovate a little bit with is to have a very direct measure of aspirations. It turns out we can do this in various ways and the results are quite results, robust to it, as long as we started from the measurement in a particular dimension. So we asked them actually, so we said it's a multidimensional thing, we, we, we told them that, um, so we asked them, sorry, um, you know, uh, in, in, in a dimension of, of income, cash income, um, on liquidity really, um, on, on their assets, on their social status, and on the level of education. I can tell you, we've done it now also in one or two other countries, the social uh, status Stephen? one actually never worked. Yes, can you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a timekeeping announcement. I think we'll we'll go for another twenty minutes, and we'll okay. do a, we'll do away with the question and answer. So, um, you know, since we're getting enough as it is, uh, it's fine. So, let's yeah. just give you more People time can... to go through the paper. And... Okay, that's that's fine. So, just to interrupt. Okay. So, but anyway, so we, we asked four dimensions and we did the following on the aspiration expectations, the following. You know, we've experimented actually, and we, in Kenya, we did a much more in-depth work with psychologists and doing it. And in fact, in the end, we ended up with more or less the same again. So we basically asked them in aspirations, you know, um, first what they, we asked the question, what they wish to attain, you know, and, and it's like they're, then it becomes very much their own personal aspiration. Uh, and, and we asked them, we, we did it a little bit framed. We let them explain where they thought they were now. And then we say, well, what would you like to at, uh, attain in the future? Yeah. The expectation is more time bound. And arguably, I, I don't really like us to use necessarily the word expectation in the, in the strict sense here, because if you believe that, that reference points are set with some kind of um, uh, based on, on, on your recent experiences, uh, the framing that we gave them, you know, probably led them to actually tell us something that is that is that is very much in line with that. So, um, and so basically, we asked them what they expect to attain in ten years. The two measures are very very strongly correlated, and in fact, all the results are quite quite similar. I think the main thing is here is we ask them to think about something about the future where they think they could be, uh, not some kind of vague hope, but we, because we framed it, we, we, we're very much starting from where they were. We were not making them dream of being the equivalent of uh, a kid telling us, suggesting that they could be Sachin Tandulkar, but more like, you know, within your own context, where, where do you think you can get to? And uh, the advantage of the expectation was that it was time bound. So it's a bit more benchmarked in that sense. We made a very simple index of it. We could have done other things. So we basically uh, standardized the, the measurement for, for each of them relative to the mean. And then um, we, did, we had a game where we asked them what, which of the four dimensions is the most important. And we allowed them to have a subjective weight to it for some aspiration index. If we simply give them a weight of a quarter, we actually get exactly the same, same results. The, what we do is very similar, actually, to what Beeman et al. and, and Beeman and Duflo and others had done in, uh, in West Bengal with their study of uh, female leaders in the Panchayat, yeah, uh, of measurement. So what's the result? It's quite interesting. You know, you can imagine that we'll get pretty noisy measure, but we were actually struck even at a short run after six months. We didn't get very strong results on the aspiration thing, but 
at least it moved in the direction that we thought. And, and you can look at the first column, and I'm not trying to try to sell this really to you, isn't it striking? Because we have a set of results on the overall index and largely on the education of children, the, the, the hope for the education of, of children in, in, in years, uh, that actually we're getting a treatment effect although it's insignificant compared to the treatment in the placebo. What we thought gets actually more interesting is that when we go back five years later, for the overall aspiration index, we got actually quite similar results, strikingly, and the treatment versus placebo is significant and also robust to multiple testing. And especially on the education, we still get kind of very clear, clear results there. So it seems we've done something. This is quite a noisy measure. I'm not going to oversell it, but it seems to be something happened here, at least with this measure. Actually, we were more convinced because once we looked at the expectations, which you could, you know, you could have a whole thing is saying, well, you're boosting their aspirations. They're already incalculating that they're going to change their behavior a little bit. And you ask them what you think you're going to get after 10 years. Arguably, it gives us a better sense of what we're doing in terms of shifting reference points. We actually found in the short run, in the long run, uh, short run some results, in the long run quite strong results uh, for the overall expectation index, highly significant also for us to multiple testing hypothesis, and again, largely driven, but not entirely through the education side. So, well, and that actually is quite, quite, quite a big effect. So we kind of, um, you know, it's like, um, this is in years, we, we, we managed to get uh, basically families to hope, and this is for, for their eldest child, we simply asked, what the education do you uh, expect them achieve? And those people that were exposed to the video relative to the placebo um, uh, and relative to the control group within the village, we clearly managed to boost uh, by, 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 uh, by up to a year um, their expectations of education. And say, so, well, that actually is quite striking the, in terms of, 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 of a result, okay? Don't have to buy well, entirely. Are, the, active, always, sorry? Well, are the activities human capital intensive? I mean, in the sense that the yeah. aspirations that people have are, no, that, does it require education? That's an excellent point. Because the activities, the, the, the activities they do are not, not necessarily human capital intensive, but it's very interesting because it co comes back to the content of the videos. What's very striking is that none of these people told a story that they got better off because they invested in their own education or something, or they were lucky that their parents had chosen to invest in their education. There's nothing like that there. But actually, and the way I would definitely, I, I kind of know these settings quite well, um, these villagers spent lots of time there, you know, for a lot of people, and I, I, I know you, 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 I'm not sure it's still the case, but you definitely used to have it in, 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 in rural India as well. You know, often people don't see that many options and education gets pushed quite hard as an, as an opportunity to, to progress as the way out of your, your misery. And I think that's, that's what seems to be happening a bit in Ethiopia as well. So it's not that we told them you should do education, nor do they do a lot of things, but it actually links that and say, well, you know, you know, I don't know what I really do, but let me put at least my effort and my resources in getting my child educated. Because we should really say the alternative for these children to get education is working at home on the farm. The alternative to, to, edu uh, to, to the education of children is actually having also a bit more cash to consume today. So it is an investment that these parents uh, may well make, but, but we should stop for a second here and saying, look, this is just the expectation. I've not even shown anything on behavior. We always thought it's the behavior where we need to see it. And um, so, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm more persuaded by the psychological channel uh, somewhat because actually we never suggested that this is the way should, they should be actually making progress. So the, the idea of the vicarious experience is that actually makes you stop and makes you think what can I do? You know, and, and, and I know the question came on the self-efficacy is a bit like, you know, maybe I can do it. That would be a self-efficacy kind of thing. Um, but, but within your own opportunity set as you understand it. It could also so, be, Stefan, that they had no yep. concept, they had no conception of the fact that people could not be not poor. Right? I mean, in yes. some sense, 
you know, uh, if the kind of settings you're talking about, the idea that, you know, one might take poverty as, you know, the, the thing that always happens. And basically the yep. videos showed a particular, a particular reference point, uh, an idea that, look, you know, there are people who are not living like this. Yep. So it's not the, the graduation out, but it's actually the showing the other consumption level, which might, you know, then it, it kind of rationalizes why people would be wanting to go towards that. No, no, I, I, I'm totally with you there because that's, that's in a way what we kind of want to allude to is that somehow they're exposed to people that look, that definitely started where they are and actually managed to be successful and then they look for their own way. So it's not an information transfer, but it's something like opening the mind that there is another world out there. So this is also when earlier the question came, why I also say like things like locus of control you know, where basically say, how am I, and people ask, ask actually the question, how do you measure things like that? So, so um, self, uh, locus of control is basically, am I determining my own future or is it God or external circumstances determine it? And there's some quite established ways of doing that to actually test that. And so, so again, we know in our data, these things move together now with our, with, in our treatment group as well with the aspiration thing. And, and similarly, self-efficacy would be similarly uh, something like, you know, I, I can be, I, 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 um, I, I have a sense of what is, what is possible, but also understand that, that these are the kind of efforts I have to do to, to get there. So, and all these things talk to somehow changing a reference point understanding that there is a world out there that you can achieve and you have a path to get there. And, and that actually, that the, just the exposure to the role model gets you there. I'm going to skip the next child. It's quite interesting on, on some difference between girls and boys, but the main thing is here is that we shouldn't overestimate is that we suddenly have this kind of thing. We can open these people's minds and therefore they will do all kinds of things, all the things that we think would be the right things to do. We actually can find that in these educational aspirations, they are possibly even more than before going to favor the boys now. So they do it within their own frameworks. You know, it's not as if we suddenly made them think and suddenly understand, you know, some kind of new value system. You know, they actually suddenly become more ambitious, but it includes a little bit having a higher, a relatively speaking, higher aspiration for the, for the boy in the future, maybe even more than they had to start with. So there's definitely no closing of the gender gap in these things. The interesting thing is, and let me, let's, uh, we immediately come to that. What we thought, and that's why we got excited and then actually decided to do it five years later as well. These expectations and aspirations around education, they were already after six months shown in behaviors. They were actually beginning to send their children more to school, which is the first line there where we have a short treatment effect. So the young children were being sent more to school. Now, um, what, is, what is then, um, that's, that's, that's striking. And also they were spending, the children were spending more minutes in the school. That was actually the strongest result where basically we get the treatment relative to the control, but also better than the, than the placebo, where they actually were spending um, per week up to um, before, um, actually per day, 45 uh, more minutes to school. That actually means it's not just school children are going more to school, but there were actually fewer children kept at home occasionally to do work and whatever. So that was actually found very striking. And what was quite striking for us furthermore, that when we looked at the long run results, this, you know, primary schools are free, secondary schools are not. It got translated at, uh, at, at, at end line, children uh, having, having higher attainment, uh, but also with more spending actually happening, the school expenditure um, on, on children still. So, so we actually, it wasn't just briefly and then it dis dis disappeared. That cohort went actually clearly to school and more was invested in, the, in, the, in that cohort of children, which we very striking, you know? And, you know, we're talking there uh, for very, very poor people that they're spending $6 more 
per family, uh, per family on, on, on education. That's not insignificant in a world where you know, yearly incomes, uh, if they go above 500, we would be, would be really surprised. And of course, they are very poor to start with. So these are meaningful increases. Um, and I forget for a moment what it is relative to the standard uh, error uh, at the mean. Um, um, but, it, but, it, but it is definitely, um, um, it, it's definitely significant. I think it's half a standard deviation, yeah. Um, so, so I just, uh, quick, quick question, uh, would it be correct to interpret this as saying that they, uh, that, you know, the treatment essentially is responding by sending the children to, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, secondary schools that, um, and through, more through private schools or, or public? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so this is where we different, very different from India, there are no private schools there. This is these remote villages, there's only have the state schools. And if you go to the secondary school, you have to go to the town. So we will have what we see in the data, then we'll have a bit more. So we have children aged 12 to 15, we have more of them um, now have attained, which is essentially the first year of, of, um, the, the, of, of high school, sometimes that locally offered in the primary school, or it's already further. So we we get that first part of your statement there that that, that some some of these children indeed more more, more is more is happening, uh, but it's not private schools. It's simply that second that 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 um, once it comes to seventh and eighth grade, you usually have to put some money in, not necessarily for school fees, but all the materials need to be paid for because actually the schools have very poor, very limited budget. So, uh, so it's a sign that you invest in, in them. So it's not just enrollment, but also a bit of investment. Yeah. Yeah, but Stefan, how much of this is like an unintended good consequence? So one of the things could be that at the baseline, when, when there are these adults who decided, who saw this you know, more rosy future, they started working more. And now they had, they had to basically send their children somewhere so that they send them to school. And now that could be a good habit. And once children start going to school, you know, at some point it becomes optimal to then keep them in school and invest in that, right? Yeah. The primary objective could have been more childcare. Yeah. No, no, that, and that, that's an interesting. Well, yeah, the, the childcare, yeah, we could argue about it. You know, this, this is, I, I, I would probably have doubted given the, the rule setting. Uh, given that these people are working on fields next to their uh, houses and, and, and things like that. But, um, but, 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 but that other thing, that unintended consequence, I mean, we, we definitely, the habit can definitely be part. And it's actually quite an interesting thing. I mean, the, the samples become too small. But we thought, you know, looking at some of these, um, you know, and, and in fact, you can see this actually. If you look at the long run results, um, the... Um, if you look at the long run results, the, oh no, we didn't show it on this table. Sorry, it's not entirely right. The, the children seven to 11 at a, uh, five years later, which basically would have been children uh, two years old or six years old or so at a, in the first, in, 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 at a midline, um, we don't see that there's an increase in education. So it's, there's definitely, so there appears to be in the education one suggested that it's some cohort effect. And then, then, then the habit is there and then they kept them there. Or maybe saying, look, we've invested in these children now, we got excited about it, we better keep them. And that's then the child that actually gets them the, the, the treatment and the younger children are not, not doing it. So there's something possible there. I can't discount it. And, and, how, um, and, and can, it, can it be an income effect? Just the fact that in the long run now the treatment is richer and therefore yeah. they find sending well, children to school. Yeah. Look, and the income effects will play through here. Of course, they, 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 you, you could have it. But, but it, you know, I still take comfort that all your comments would be totally the, the most plausible one if we didn't say anything happening in the short run. But we saw something happening in the short run as well. So I would say all these things are possible, but I do think something started there by keeping these children more in school and less at home um, in, the, in, the, in the midline after six months. And then, yeah, then it could have been uh, it, all the things that you described. Yeah, then that's really, we can't distinguish that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. good. Um, but, and, and it's a little bit also there, then, then uh, some of the results become then uh, interesting too, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, 
we also said, look, you know, if you, are you really going to get uh, um, future oriented? We found already in the short run here, if you look at the column of the treatment versus placebo, that they actually were uh, spending less time um, in this kind of casual wage labor and investing more in their farm. And that's really an interesting result eh? because casual wage labor is cash in hand. That's the, that's the low effort activity. Uh, sorry, that's the low risk activity. Working on the farm, you may get your income next year. So that, that's, that's a much more tricky one. It takes time to get your revenue from it. And we clearly saw that in the time allocation thing that they shifted it. And then interestingly, the scale of these changes are broadly speaking still there, even though not significant treatment versus placebo, but strongly significant for the treatment group. The daily minutes on the farm uh, are actually have gone up, um, have gone, uh, have continued to go up. So they clearly are more invested in their farm, which is the place, the only place really that they tend to make a bit more money, but it's a bit more risky and it's harder work uh, than, than, than before. So that's, that's uh, we seem to see this, this kind of less leisure and more effort uh, being put in it. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, interesting tendency there as well. So, so we get it on the work side. We also seem to be getting them um, in the long run. And then I'll take meet the upper group. You don't have to make the comment. This could be an income effect as well, what we now see. Um, but we basically say that we see that, that at least, uh, if anything, there's a virtuous cycle because they now start investing more in the, in the technologies that are yield improving. Um, they do it um, in, in, in terms of um, their modern inputs for the, for the crops and also the supplies for the, the veterinary supplies as well. And we seem to get the, a tendency for these results. In fact, the strongest one is actually the purchasing the feed, which I find again very interesting because we know from other studies in these settings, getting rich in Ethiopia is actually in the rural areas is accumulating livestock and moving more and more into livestock away from crop agriculture. So they clearly are investing in probably what I still think is maybe the best route for getting better off getting their animals healthy, breeding more with them, and so on. But it's, it's interesting. We see it in the value of their livestock they're holding. You know, $100 more, uh, you know, if people have an income of maybe 500 or a bit like that per year, managing to get after five years the treatment group. Again, I'll repeat uh, or mention uh, again here, one hour of doc documentaries uh, gives you $100 after five years of, um, in, in terms of livestock. Okay, that's something like okay it's maybe only a third of a of a young cow of a, of a heifer uh, but it's still pretty good other assets have gone up as well uh in dollar terms there as well so we see them doing it uh some of these activities and accumulating assets so i mean our interpretation is really you know you invest in your children's education you're putting more in assets you're putting more in in uh, you know the, the inputs in more modern agriculture, that's forward 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 looking or for, future oriented orient uh, future sorry that is future oriented behavior that is looking to the future and trying to boost this. Uh, people have said you know well you know you boost the aspirations are they making money out of air? You know this is where it is quite interesting. Oh, I was about wrong. The, the, the treatment effect is not half a cow, but 0.7 of a cow. Yeah. Um, the, and, and these are significant things, you know, that, that, that actually, that's quite a lot of gains that they have uh, there. But on the slide, we tried to explain a little bit what we think has been happening. We found, and I'm not showing it because it's so hard to measure this properly, but um, very few people were saving a baseline. And uh, we had already observed there, it wasn't really a, 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 an indicator that we had um, uh, put in our pre-analysis plan, but we could see them that they were actually saving a bit more. You know, they, they were saving already a bit, a bit more after six months. As I, we told you, they were already spending 30 minutes or 45 minutes relative to placebo, more time on the farm. They were uh, in tech adoption. Uh, we definitely saw it in the long run to doing it. So. So they, they're shifting their portfolio of, of efforts of, away from leisure, they're a, a bit more savings rather than consumption, and cumulatively over a couple of years with a virtual cycle involved in it, 
it's, it's, it seems to be possible. So change in the portfolio, they're not dramatic, but they are significant. You know, you have a small intervention. We seem to be, this is not money out of thin air. This is not, we can't, this is actually fairly consistent in our results that this is behavior that, yeah, surely that could deliver you bits of these outcomes. Now, what's really interesting, and I'll come really to the end now quickly, is the family prediction. What is it happening with welfare effects? You know, um, it's always tricky with this kind of uh, models where you try to say we want to encourage more savings. Now, of course, you don't know whether then you keep on doing that and keep pushing people, uh, will keep on pushing people to move always more savings to the future. So your consumption could be lower. Um, so it wasn't entirely necessarily clear, and it's not a clear prediction what the consumption level should be after six months or after one year, or after five years for that matter. If you get very future oriented, you could just, I'm not consuming anything anymore and I'm going to put everything in the future, if that's really what's happening. But we also said like, you know, we measured the subjective well-being as well, to try to get a sense of, you know, do they sense they're at least uh, are they getting better off or whatever, or are they actually getting frustrated because we've really pushed them to do things, and then after five years, what's life looks like now? You know, we 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 got too far, and it's quite an interesting thing. So we do overall, we, we're very cautious uh, how we say it, but actually, you know, there's nothing that goes down, and the only thing that happens is certain things go up in their in their welfare effect. So we see increases in durable, uh, small increases in non-durable consumption, non-food, non-durable consumption, that should read. Their houses are better. They have um, more people that have actually a latrine that they, they built. We have an increase in subjective well-being. It's not significant, but it's definitely not a decrease. You know, it's definitely not going down if they really got very, very frustrated. So, so we, we, we seem to be, and you, we shouldn't forget, they're investing in their children meanwhile. So they've pushed some things to their future. And, um, and life is clearly a little bit better uh, from, from what we did. So that's- But Stefan, in this, you know, I mean, this, these are results on an average, right? These are the expected values. So for a question like this, wouldn't one have to kind of show a, kind of a distribution in the sense that you could have, you know, a particular number of people actually in the sample, you know, say that they're worse off. But yeah, on the majority, probably they said they're better off. But then the worry always with some of these interventions is that, you know, once you make this, then you have to kind of, in some sense, give an insurance that no one will be worse off. And that's hard yeah, to do, right? Okay, right. But but look, and, and um, look, I've been very careful here in terms of saying it. I mean, if I think of the endless interventions we do on the material side, giving them, telling them to do, grow a new crop or doing, or even sending their children to school, you know, that's not necessarily for every child the best solution, nor is it for every farmer the best solution, given their own capabilities or whatever to do these things. So we always have that, and I agree with you. I would simply say, you know, the, uh, there's more to look at. And in fact, you make an excellent point that I actually, especially on the consumption, we should look a little bit more on, you know, percentages that go down, percentages that go up, and whatever. Um, the, at least on, on average, between placebo and treatment and control, we don't have any difference. Uh, uh, sorry, we, 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 if anything, we have improvements, we never have decreases. But, but you would say that maybe we should look at the spreads. Maybe the, the treatment group have now a far bigger spread relative to the control group. And I take your point and we should look at that. That's an excellent point. Yeah. And, uh, and definitely possible. It's, there's always now possible problems with, with sample size and so on. We can at least plot them and look at them and see what happens. So let me not show the, 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 the table on that, but I, I kind of told you the essence is. I already mentioned it. Is it a, are they better or because they follow the advice of these role models? There's no evidence there. Okay, there's really no relationship there. We also test the time preferences, risk aversion at midline and end line, time preference at, risk, at, 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 at uh, midline and end line. Okay, not perfectly. These are non incentivized experiment, uh, tests that we had. We didn't have really the resources to do it incentivized. I actually know from another study we did in Kenya, this kind of video interventions don't seem to shift these things, uh, the time preference. So it's not simply discount factors. Um, interestingly, even though I've talked it up, 
in the short run, we saw changes in locus of control. Uh, some other tests that we did was around self-esteem. Interestingly, this kind of point of view of locus of control, that I'm in control of my destiny and I wasn't in the past, um, or, or, I, so I'm, I'm in control of my destiny and it's not the gods or external fa factors. We saw a positive effect of that in the short run. In the long run, it wasn't there. You know, a few times in the conversation, the word habit has come into it. Maybe that's the only thing that happens, that actually for a while we managed them to excite them, lock them into terms of behavior and they're doing it now. And maybe the psychological factors are not showing up anymore very strongly. So in a far bigger study, we did village level randomization in Kenya. It's actually what we begin to find, that the psychological impacts are not necessarily persistent, but the economic things are. And, and actually, in a sense, it's really nice that many of you have raised the point on the habit, because maybe it is indeed that we set them off into a cause of action, and then it becomes a bit like what we often think that people do, they settle in behaviors. But we settle them in a slightly upward trajectory relative to where they were, and that's there. Finally, social desirability bias. We have various things that we wanted to test. You know, they're not necessarily going to do that, say, the, the government tells them that's their way of making progress. Uh, we not, there's no evidence of anything that we may have implied by the way we did the questionnaire. So we have a number of maybe not the most sophisticated tests, but we don't quite have that. Okay, that's my conclusion coming up. Light touch intervention, it changes it. You know, one hour, just some videos, very striking. Children's education is probably the biggest effect, effects on the aspiration and the expectations. But we also see human capital investments. We see behavioral shifts in, in the agricultural inputs, in the stock of productive assets. We see changes in some changes in the consumption, definitely no decreases. And I mentioned a few times this other study 430 village we did in Kenya with something quite similar. And we combined it with a big cash transfer as well. They got a massive amount of money. And so we have a, basically some only got psychological intervention. Some only got the cash transfer. Some got both. What was really interesting, that the size of the effects we monitor now, which are they're virtually identical in Kenya to what I've just described in, Ken, in, in Ethiopia, the size of the effects benchmarked against the thousand dollars would suggest that we may well have given them in this one hour video a transfer of the size of about two or three hundred dollars which we're a bit struck by that uh proportionately so basically we get proportionately the effects of about one-fifth to a third of the impact of a thousand dollar cash transfer program uh, in terms of the assets accumulation behavior and i'll stop now and sorry for the, the, the bad start, but I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Dirkwan, could you, could you comment a bit on the political standing of the groups of people in the sample? Because the groups that might expect some support from the government might not respond equally to these videos on aspirations. They might, uh, but then there yeah. are groups like Afar or Somali, they, they don't expect any support from the government and they might be more strongly influenced by such interventions? Yeah, so actually, um, you know, the, the, and you, 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 you show your, your, your knowledge on the ground on Afar and Somalis and so on, it's worth mentioning there. We are still in Oromia, insight. We're not in one of the disputed areas where there is a lot of Somali or Afar migrants in it. Because of this escarpment, these massive cliffs, you do not really have, uh, as you have, for example, more in the southern part of this region, the entrance of more, you know, uh, historically cattle farming, Afar or Somalis that maybe have also do now crop agriculture. This is actually quite ethnically homogenous in that setting. So it's not Afar versus Somali, it's not inter-ethnic that the issue is. It doesn't mean that there are not people that potentially are better connected or not. But again, you know, we, we are, um, I've in the past I've done papers on political connectivity in, in Ethiopia and their access to resources from government. Um, the size, I, I found significant effects of some of these things. The size were tiny. I've actually no, I don't know anyone who's done it 
in Ethiopia since. And this was about access to uh, transfer programs. Um, the sizes were significant but tiny, you know, few percentage differences in access. Um, in this community, you know, because it's already so far, and this is a very poor district, Florida, as we call it, we're just getting too far from the centers of where the focus is. You know, the, the interest of government is to just make, keep it going. This is not a high potential area. So, so this is, there's a bit of a sense of, we need to be there for relief. It's not, to, be, to be frank, I don't mean it in any bad sense. They don't really know very well what to do there because this is such an impoverished area. It, there's some programs there, but but it's not a. I, I I would doubt it, but it's a good point. In in, in it maybe in other areas in Ethiopia, I wouldn't think it's a, a, a big issue here as well. But we also wouldn't quite have the sample anymore to start getting much more heterogeneous effects uh, within it. We're not powered for doing that in more detail. But good point. Um, I just uh, I just want to take time out right now and thank our speaker Stefan Durkon for a really really interesting talk um, and for all the participants and their questions. Um, thank you for making this. Uh, um, I think we are virtually out of time. Um, so if you have more questions, I guess you can always write them in an email. Um, uh, Absolutely. But but uh, for now. Well, you want to hold on for five more minutes? Just. I mean, others can leave. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I can stay on for another five minutes. All right, all right. So then we can take five more minutes of questions. Uh, this. No, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, the setting that you, I mean, many things that you are doing in some sense in this paper are and seem completely relevant for the setting that you have, this clay, you know, these people stuck in the clay for whatever. I mean, completely away from reality. But the thing is that if I, once we look at, you know, these kind of interventions and of course, you know, it, there is, it seems that there are these light touch things which, which have hope, right, in the long run. You know, how should we think about, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, it's not so much external validity, but I mean, if I were to take these results and then say, okay, I want to do something like this in India or some other place, what would be the markers I would need to look for? Because, you know, I mean, in some sense, some of the papers on this aspiration, I, I'm reminded of some papers on human capital using young lives and stuff. They have this frustration kind of people lagging behind from aspirations and then kind of, you know, human capital goes the other way and stuff. So how do you calibrate some an intervention like this to yeah. then kick it forward to do it in other places? So, so, so let me tell you a little bit because, you know, on the back of this paper, you know, the, the work we were doing in Kenya is with this uh, NGO called uh, Give Directly with, um, with basically, um, um, oh gosh, for a moment, his name escapes me, uh, the guy in San Diego. Anyway, the, but it's this NGO, it's also these researchers that, um, from, for that, that used to be at Harvard that set it, set it up and they give these very big cash transfers. They got very excited because, you know, a lot of people who are doing programs like cash transfer programs, uh, were, find it very striking that when they get all these cash transfers, there's not that much being put into productive activities. And not necessarily for the same reason as we have learned in microfinance that say, oh, people try to smooth their things and whatever. Mm -hmm. They were actually quite struck that, you know, they put it all in their roofs of their houses, which is fine, but you know, very few people try to actually invest it to get some return. And when they saw our, our results, they said, look, can we team up in Kenya? And this is the study in Kenya is essentially these people give a thousand dollars to you know thousands of people in Kenya, and we basically have a bit of a you know we, we basically envisaged it as well. And they thought maybe the combined intervention may actually be an interesting idea, because I'm pretty sure now at the end of this we don't do any harm with showing them a video. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's far worse things that we do where we offer inputs and and technology to, to poor villagers for the, the reasons that you said earlier, Abu. So I don't think we do much harm. There's definitely no evidence here of any of, of much harm. I, I need to dig in further. You raised a good point on that, but I don't really think so. Showing them an hour long video, telling stories from people from their community uh, is, is thing. So, you know, if you could think of it, well, it, it tells you something about how you approach people in communities. It's probably there's a do no harm thing that you can do here that's actually, you know, making them at least think a bit about their own future, taking their, their own future in their own hands, 
and it's a good thing. You could that do in all kinds of settings. I'm less clear about how you would do that. Okay, in Kenya, which is people have all mobile phones and so on, we still manage to clearly shift a lot of exactly the same as in Ethiopia what they want to do. But I'm not going to say that uh, it will translate into um, Mumbai or something. Um, it 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 won't translate necessarily there. But but it tells you just something, just take that into account, that people have had tough lives, they are vicious circles, and maybe it, it adds to this idea some psychological interventions make quite a lot of sense. So this is not an external validity point, but just saying, clock that. And it's an easy thing. If you do interventions, if you do studies for that matter, why don't you build it in and see whether it actually helps to get a better intervention delivered. I actually typically think if I go back in poverty, reduction programs in my own country, in Europe. So I always, I, I used to be as a, as a, as a, my late teens involved in programs there. And, you know, of course, totally different. But, but these, these aspiration traps, this kind of giving up hope things is something that's universal with people that are stuck at the bottom end of, mm -hmm. of income distributions. And so I was very struck that to reach all these groups over time in the European context, it needed an awful lot of social workers mm. that talked with them, talked them up, kept them going, motivated them and so on. And I think it, I see it more in that sense. We are now working with BRAC in, we're now working with BRAC in Bangladesh that actually some of their, their graduation program, they actually were doing this and they just wanted to now actually doing this a little bit more systematically. So I think there is a use to it. I don't see it as the, I'll never sell it as this magic uh, being this, this silver bullet that is going to solve it. You know, I, I tell you anecdotally, you know, I started this study when I was chief economist at DFID. I wanted to do something that didn't involve handing cash to people or telling them what to do. And I, that was one of my motivations with this study. And I'm quite pleased to actually say, look, you don't have to keep on saying it's all government, it's all intervention. You know, maybe listening a bit more to people and understand where they are for me, that's as big a lesson here. These things matter. That's probably what I like about the paper is I can show that these things matter. I'm not going to say I'm going to design now the perfect set of interventions on the back of it, but I want to just people be conscious about that. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, there's a couple of people who've raised hands. So uh, Swati, why don't, you, why don't you just go ahead with your question? Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, so a very interesting talk and it has given me a lot to think about because I'm trying to see the, uh, like a lack of aspirations among female uh, workers in manufacturing factories. So, um, so like, uh, so it's kind of it has given me quite a bit of ideas and I would really love to look at the literature. So um, that's one. And second is like in Indian context, a lack of aspiration can be directly linked to cultural barriers, which are much more high for women. And like you also say that uh, you find that effect for uh, boys are uh, larger, right? Uh, you don't yeah. find uh, such strong effects for girls. So in a way, like uh, maybe there are cultural barriers in that society also, and this intervention is not able to help them overcome that. So uh, is there any like uh, line of thought you can give me uh, where yeah. I can pick on that? Yeah, so, so, so that, and that's a really good question. So, so if you're interested a little bit more in digging deeper into these boys and girls things, so there is a, we had in papers and proceedings of the American Economic Association, I think last year, a paper there that actually dis explores this in these data. So it's a bit strange that paper got published before we really properly cleaned up the, 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 the full paper. We had some other issues with uh, uh, doing this, but, but, but you can do it. And, and so the essence is probably the best interpretation of our results is that we may boost their aspirations, but if these are still aspirations within their own cultural context. They still go for the things that they believe is the way out. And unfortunately, the cultural barriers means that actually, you know, these are self-beliefs that actually it is better to invest in the boy than in the girl. And it's, it's, um, and as you say, there's no evidence this, this could be, a, this, this is likely to be a totally a bias, or this is a total bias, but it's, um, 
it is somehow ingrained. And it, it links a bit with that literature on, on reference point. You know, these, these points are culturally, locally embedded, you know, and, and, um, you know, and, and our intervention largely focused on getting getting out of poverty in a kind of generic sense. We try to at least be gender neutral. We have two women, two men that tell the stories, but it's interesting because proportionally, I'm sure far more men manage to get, get out of poverty in these societies than actually women are created, uh, have the opportunity to do this. Uh, we didn't find any gender effects, you know, in favor, affecting favor, but also we didn't quite design it like this. So I think there's a fascinating study could be uh, and you think of the, the, the Beeman et al. study on West Bengal, focused, of course, on female leaders. That was directly it. And they can show, you know, if you expose them to female role models very deliberately and very much focused, you may be able to do things like that. The, because, and but it's, it's this usual thing with the cultural barriers. You know, it's, un, it's not entirely clear. I mean, we could believe that modernism, you know, the idea that when societies get richer, they will move out of these things will work. But we see it even in Western societies. Just getting richer wasn't enough to get gender equality. Getting yeah, richer is not to get racism out of society. So these discrimination, these culture embedded racism things, uh, the culture embedded discrimination things, sorry, um, are, are, are ingrained and need more specific interventions. So I would say you'll need a targeted intervention around that. Okay, thank you. We have we have two more people, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it there because. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. All right. So yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I was actually thinking uh, uh, more in terms of you know so you um, uh, say the this set of uh, the poorer section of people who are kind of giving up hope. If it is the case that they are say residentially also uh, a cluster then this kind of hopelessness about individual motivation can lead to also collective action failure. So they give up hope on uh, demanding more from the government uh, in terms of providing amenities, et cetera. Uh, is there a literature um, on that in terms of you know, improving uh, aspiration at the collective level and overcoming collective action failure? I'm, I'm sure sociologists and ecologists have talked about it. But if you ask for some kind of an empirical or, or, or um, an economic literature, not that I know of, and I think you should do it. It's definitely a, an interesting thing is that, you know, in, in the, it's actually almost a straightforward extension from a lot of the collective action literature is that just as, you know, our framework was people are not investing in profitable opportunities for themselves because of these things. You could have a collective hope uh, failure. You know, you, you you settle in a low in a low in a low equilibrium, and, and for maybe different reasons than we often assume in terms of collective action equilibrium. So now it's an excellent point. I, I don't know it, but I think we should do it. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> All right, and the the last the last question, uh, Diotona, you can go ahead. So uh, I earlier asked you about uh, self-efficacy. So this is just a request. Can, uh, we have tried to model the model aspiration in an alternative way uh, using self-efficacy. Can I send you the paper? So this is just so, a request. Yeah, it's not even that you can do it. You have to. You please do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll do it just now. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right, and with that, I think we will we will end. So thanks again, Stephen. It was a great nice Thanks, Stephen. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, day. and thanks for your patience. That first twenty minutes to twenty five minutes. I, I'm sorry. I I don't know what was I, going I, I on. saw your I I saw that all the skills learned at DFID work. You were super cool under tremendous technical pressure. I mean, okay, so. I, I can tell you because this one of the reasons why is a bit that because I'm back actually working in the successor of DFID since two weeks ago, I and um, you know I I I have a I, I'm working directly for the foreign minister, the foreign secretary. He yeah. shouts at everybody all the time. I think this last two weeks I've learned to be calm because there's no point getting worried. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, it's good to okay. see you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye then.